darkness. Because without the light of the Lord, it's darkness. Anything without him, anything where he isn't, anything that he's not a part of is darkness. And I've been praying a lot about, Lord, what, we're, we're, so, we're on the verge of something. We've been on the verge of something for so long. And I'm asking, I'm like, you know, am I holding, am I, am I, am I, am I, is there something in me holding this church back? And he said, yes. I was like, okay, humility, there's darkness. And immediately I went back to the basement, right? The, the basement and I saw cobwebs. And there's cobwebs in my own heart. Spiders love the darkness. They love to build their little nests in the cobwebs. And I don't know if any of you, you know, you, you leave your basement alone, then you turn on the light, you go down there, there's cobwebs everywhere. It's like, oh, these spiders, they thrive in the darkness when you just leave them alone. And there's places inside of us that, you know, even if we talk to the Lord every day, even if we, you know, even if we love him with all of our hearts, there's still, is he shining his light in every part of us? And then something happens or something is said and it brings out the darkness in us, right? Something happens, or there's a situation, or a person, and you know that darkness pops its ugly head up. And so, I'm just asking the Lord to shine His light, shine Your light, Lord, shine Your light in me, in my heart, and to choose light. Yes. To choose light. We are the light of the world. We are the salt. We are the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ. And if we won't shine, then this world remains in darkness. And that's not always fun to light up the darkness. It's not, it's not comfortable when, when the light first shines after you've been in darkness. It's not, it's not pretty, it's not comfortable, it's painful. You, you, don't, you can't even see, right? When the light first shines, you've been in darkness for a long time and suddenly there's a bright light, it's painful. Yes. But the Lord says, come to the light and let our light shine. So I don't know if that speaks to anybody this morning, but I'm just asking the Lord to shine all the light in my heart and in my life and to bring, uh, and, and I, I guess the other thing is, he said we have to seek it. It doesn't just come. We have to ask for it and we have to seek it. So I encourage everybody this morning to seek the light and to ask the Lord if there's anything that he wants to do in each of us. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise, Praise the Lord. Amen. So anybody have anything they'd like, any prayer requests, any testimonies, anything this morning? Yeah, Don. I'd like to clarify a few things. We did not go to Mississippi. <laughs> we did not go to Colorado. We went up on the Mississippi River to Pikes Peak in State Idaho. Park. <laughs> My nephew accused me of being in Colorado because I've been in Pikes Peak. I said, no, that's Park Harris. So I don't know how John got Mississippi the State, but the Mississippi the River. We really cheated on to Two and a half days. <laughs> blew this pop stand. And got away from grandkids. We didn't. It was unbelievable. We didn't have to answer <laughs> We'll pay for it. Roll my whip. We'll pay for it. Enjoyed your first selfie. Thanks for sharing that with all of us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, funny. Well, welcome back. Welcome yeah. back. <laughs> Anyone else? Any prayer requests or any testimonies this morning? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do want to ask a prayer for Allison and Ryan. He works on the side. We go with trucks and whatever. And uh, this has been going on for probably six months. They're over a lot of money. Mm -hmm. That you can't go to small claims court. It, it just doesn't work out. But, but the finances were coming for them, what's owed to them. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yes. Amen. Amen. Uh, just continue prayer for uh, the island of Puerto Rico and the people there. I read an article from one of the government agencies that now they're anticipating the power of is going to take a whole year to fix it. So uh, there's still a 20% electricity overall. Uh, luckily, or not luckily, but uh, my hometown is one of the few places where there's actual power because there was a lot of damage done. Uh, so my family has, been, has, has had electricity for the past two weeks. Uh, yeah, so a lot of people are getting desperate and everything's not uh, working. 
at 100 percent. Apparently, teachers are going to be laid off for about four months uh, because the school semester is going to be completely lost. So both my sisters are going to be without an income pretty much until next year, mm -hmm. if that actually ends up happening. So there's a lot of things going on that um, are not physically seen that are that coming out um, as a result of the impact of the hurricane. So just continue prayer for all of that to take, be taken care of and that hopefully they listen to our advice because Kelly and I have been trying to talk to them to make a decision as to what they're going to do so we know how to help them but they're still bouncing around back and forth. I don't know, I don't know. I'll tell you later. Well, the longer you delay it, the worse it's going to be. So, just keep in prayer for that. Yeah. Yeah, good for your family and everybody in Puerto Rico. This morning I was thinking of the day of the fire when I came over the bridge and I saw the smoke and I just knew. I prayed for grace. I said, God, you know, only your grace is going to get me through this. And I know without a doubt that it was all God that got me through those few days. <clears throat> but this morning I, I was sort of thinking and reminded that in the day in and the day out, you know, we're more conscious when there's troubled times or we're in turmoil or something has happened. But, you know, just for every day that we're more conscious and aware of the grace that we've been given mm -hmm. and that we continue to reveal the grace that he's given us just in the everyday, yeah. you know, to the people that you're around every day to continue to walk in it, not just in the troubled times, but just on your every, every day. Be more conscious of it and aware of it and walking it. Mm -hmm. Makes it more real to us, too, mm -hmm. when we're just aware. <clears throat> Absolutely. And yeah, Don. I, I don't know how I had forgotten that. But one night when we were up there and quiet, you're in a strange place, you know, you don't always sleep the best. So I was laying there pondering all, all the things going on in the world and all. <clears throat> I just asked the Lord. Show me, tell me what lies ahead. You know, for, for us, what where do we fit into this cosmos? And Lord, if it's not too much, would you give me a dream? Now I I didn't really I guess I, I wanted an answer, but I really didn't expect it that. Mm -hmm. and, and that night, nothing. The next night. I had this dream. <clears throat> I told Jane, I said, most peculiar. But there was a young woman. I, you know how a dream is. You just are in it someplace. You don't know how you got there. You don't know who all these people All of a sudden, in this place. And this young woman was telling me, she said, I don't know why there had to be a New Testament. It confuses people. And I said, well, what do you mean? She was Jewish. And she said, why does there have to be a New Testament? There, there shouldn't have been one. There's just Moses and the law and the Old Testament. And I said, well, are you aware that that New Testament was written by Jews? They were all Jews. And I said, we, as Gentiles, became Jews by adoption. We're grafted into the commonwealth of Israel. You're missing out on what God really has for you. We just accepted it, and I hate to say thank you, but if you had not rejected it as a people, we wouldn't have this opportunity. It was an incredible dream, and I woke up, and of course I told Janice, I think we're going to Israel. Well, I don't know what it all meant, but I do know that God is about ready to really do something with the state of Israel. They're, the blame that eyes are going to be open and they're going, they're susceptible. But you should have seen the look on her face when I told her. They were all Jews. It's like, I guess I didn't know that. Yeah, they were all Jews. 
They just had an experience with your Messiah. Yeah. He's yours. Yeah. We just accepted him because of that he did everything that the prophet said he would do. And she was like <coughs> blown away. And it it was thrilling because she, she you could see it, it finally it's sinking in. Mm -hmm. I get it. And I thought, oh wow. So anyway, yeah. You heard it, we'll see what happens. Amen. Amen. <laughs> And that reminds me, I don't, I don't, I didn't know what to make of it at the time, but I felt compelled to pray over the flags in our last Eastern Gate House prayer. And I always start with our American flag, but I really felt moved to pray for the flag of Israel. And I felt like there was something happening on a national level for both of these nations, and that something was on the verge. Anyway, that just felt the witness when you're talking about that. So I feel like America will somehow play a part in that revelation. Anyway, anyone else this morning? Prayer requests or testimonies? All right, well, let's stand and go to the Lord. Mm. Heavenly Father, Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we bless you this morning. Thank you for all your blessings. For all the things you have brought to us. Lord, we celebrate the victory over every attack of the enemy, every lie, every fear that he tries to plant. We have a source of that provision, Lord, that you let us in the we pray for Puerto Rico this morning, for Rico's family, Lord, that all of those needs are such a large scale, Lord, give the leaders of this, Lord, let them be the Lord, let the wisdom, let the restoration, the restoration begin, Lord. You are our Savior, and we rest for you to make a place of decision, and all that you've done, and all that you've done, and all that you've done. Today we know that you are good, that you are for us and not against us. We know that grace abounds. Let us have no thought, no fear, no worry for tomorrow, Lord, but trust in you today as we stand on the rock of our salvation, trusting and knowing, Lord, that we are unshakable, unmovable in your kingdom, Lord. And let your light so shine among men, Lord, through the love and the grace and the mercy that is poured out through your people who call upon your name, Lord. Let the words of grace be on our tongue, Lord. Let the message shine in a world so full of darkness, so full of hate, so full of anger, so full of chaos and destruction, Lord. Where else can we go for hope? Where else can we go for peace? For joy. You are the source. You are love, Lord. You are love. And you are a consuming fire, Lord. Come and consume this place this morning, Lord. Consume our fear. Consume our doubt. Consume our worry, Lord. And light up the darkness, Lord. Fill us with the light of your word, Lord. As your word, the lamp unto our feet guides the way forward. Guides the next step in every situation, Lord. Let us feast in your presence, Lord. Let us feast in the word that is placed before us, a banquet. Not for children, not built for children, but meat for the mature in Christ. Lord, let us feast and be strengthened by the word today. And let us stand firm together in the faith, pressing forward to the high calling that you have called every one of us. To run a race, Lord, not to win, but to run the race that you have already won. We are on Team Jesus. We are representatives of you and your kingdom here in this world. Let us rise and shine. Let us rise and shine as the church of Jesus Christ, as the body of Christ. The kingdom of God is loose in this city and in this nation and in this world. Lord, and we pray for peace in Jerusalem. We pray for peace in Jerusalem that the apple of your eye, Lord, would not miss out. Lord, they rejected you. Jesus, they didn't know you when you came. And you revealed yourself to us. 
and you grafted us in, but they are our brothers and sisters. And we pray that the Jewish people, Lord, the people who have known you, who are your DNA, Lord, that they will recognize you as you light up the darkness in this world, Lord. Be with us in this house this morning, Lord, as we come to worship, as we come to lift you up, Lord, as we come to feast on your word. Be with us this morning as you light up the darkness, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Just a reminder, if you brought a cell phone, to uh, turn it to silent this morning. And Eastern Gate House of Prayer, Friday, April 10th. <laughs> I'm sorry. It says April 10th. I bet that's supposed to be November. I'm guessing that is supposed to be November. I didn't even pledge. I just read that right out loud, didn't I? I could have. I just read the teleprompter with no thought for what it says. November. Yes. Any thoughts for November? November is the month of election. I just want to throw that out there. Yeah, it's there. It's there. It's there. There are shifting, and uh, as I was talking uh, to a close friend last night, that the, the storm that the, yeah. I believe I'm personally going through, uh, and I know many others are going through, you'll see uh, that I posted the ship going through a watery storm and stuff like that. But I'm starting to see a breaking in the storm, and uh, even through this week, I can. Can't even begin to start of how and when uh, this is starting to manifest. There were some situations even through this week that were horrendous. Uh, it's almost like the uh, yeah, enemy's trying to throw everything he has, but it's, it's not happening. It's just all threats, it's all toothless. Um, so we're going to press through all the way through because there's something awesome on the other side of this storm. He promised that about uh, yeah. three weeks ago. So. Amen. It Amen. takes all of us. It okay. takes all of us. Amen. You know, it reminds me uh, when Jared came to Jesus, and you know, they, they carried the woman with the issue of blood, got involved in it, and Jesus didn't get there in time. She died. And I love what he said. And this is what he's saying to us when we don't see things manifest as quickly or like we think. He looked at him and he just said, can't stop believe. Yeah. Don't, don't, it doesn't matter. We don't see it happen. And it, it, I'm glad you brought that up because it happens to all of us. Things don't manifest like we think they yeah. should or in the time that we think. And Jesus is saying to us, can't stop believe. It will. If we hold on and hold Jane, we can there's a separating. Well, what's the separating? Those that are planted and will not be moved, and those that are like the leaf on the tree. They kind of believe, but if things don't manifest, then they, they give up. We can't give up. There's no other choice. Life or death. Amen. 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 And uh, our women's conference coming up Saturday, November 11th. Hope to see all the ladies there. Gentlemen, make sure you grab flyers to invite all the ladies in your life. Uh, bring your girlfriends. Bring all your friends. I'm really looking forward to it. It's going to be awesome. And we are going to be having a soup dinner. Uh, a pot blessing. Is that what we call it? A pot blessing? That looks like borscht, I think. That looks like some really good borscht. Delicious. Delicious. Um, so, uh, Sunday, November 18th, right after the service, we'll... Uh, oh, 19th, sorry. Sorry, I, I told them the wrong date again. The Sunday, come Sunday, we'll have church on Sunday, and after the service... <laughs> we may have <laughs> 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 So anyway, yeah, the uh, the nineteenth Sunday, the nineteenth, uh, soup, uh, desserts. We'll uh, we'll have we'll uh, we'll get a sign up sheet in the back. We'll we'll make that happen. <laughs> the master of duct tape and yeah. Um, so yeah, we are. I'm looking forward to it. It's been a while since we've had a a, a gathering together. So looking forward to it. Yeah. 
So watch for a sign-up sheet in the back and hope everybody can come. Yeah, Sheila. Sure. Can I have a few people pray for this baby? It's six days of I can't get any food to stay down. She just throws it up. She threw up all night long here. And uh, so I don't know what's going on with her, but somewhere she's got to get some nutrition going. I know she doesn't look like she's malnourished and she's not lethargic, but she just gags. And everything comes right back up. That would feed her for her since last Wednesday. Since Wednesday. So, I don't know. I like to, my mom's trying to get me to take her to the emergency room. <laughs> I'm trying to tell her we're going to pray for her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.
Can you go up two slides? Go up two slides. Go up two slides.
thank you for your presence, Lord. Thank you that you never leave us or forsake us, that you're with us always, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the divine direction of the Holy Spirit, that even when we don't realize, Lord, that you're directing our path, surely you do direct our steps. We thank you, Lord, that you lead us not into temptation, praise God, but deliver us from all evil. And for that, Lord, we are eternally grateful. And we give you all the thanks and the praise in Jesus' name. We say praise the Lord. Praise Amen. Lord. Give the Lord a hand. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, worship team. Thanks, Suzanne. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. <clears throat> and I want to thank everybody that was able to be here yesterday to help and did a great job. And uh, I mean, it went really quick. Praise the Lord. Of course, some of you were doing more than I was, but maybe that's why it went so quick. Praise the Lord. I was just pulling weeds because that's all I do. Praise the Lord. But we did good. It really looks a lot nicer outside, especially the street side over here. Eric and John worked over there and did a fantastic job of cleaning out all the old leaves and kind of the just the stuff that gets kind of built up over time, tree limbs. And the city came out and trimmed tree limbs, but they didn't bother to take the limbs with them. They just left them in the yard, praise the Lord. But uh, it really does look a lot nicer. And the ladies working inside did a fantastic job. It just smells fresh, looks fresh, looks clean, uncluttered, and... That's the way I like it. Praise the Lord. So thank you all for your, for your labor of love. Praise God. Amen. God's good, isn't he? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So uh, we've got a lot of scripture for you this morning. And, uh, I guess that's, <clears throat> that's Sheila's problem. Praise <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's what she does, though. Praise God. You know, people who don't understand sarcasm are awesome. <laughs> okay, praise the Lord. All right, let's uh, let's go to John chapter three and verse seventeen. Praise God. As we're as we're getting these scriptures up, uh, we just want to mention a couple of things. First of all, we are in the world, but we're not of the world. So this is a different world. Amen. And uh, we are born from above, the Scripture tells us. And so I, with that said, I'm just, I, I want to kind of preamble this or, or set this up a little, a little bit by saying that <clears throat> Jesus was radical. And I, and I know we, we acknowledge that, but I don't think we really realize how radical he was to the time that he was in. And in fact, he was so radical to the religious people that they killed him. And uh, so are we. If we understand this gospel, we're going to be radical as well. Now, it's one thing to say, okay, I understand Jesus was radical, but I don't think we understand it in the 21st century kind of mindset. Right. We try to kind of calm everything down and and maybe we're not religious, but we'll just kind of try to go with that concept, you know, to some degree, so that we're not crazy looking, you know what I mean? And by that, I don't mean the, necessarily just the way that we worship or how we respond, although those are all parts of it, but it's really more about how radically Jesus changed this whole system. He didn't come to bring us another religion. He didn't come to bring us an improved religion. He came to bring us a relationship with God that is totally separate from anything this human race had ever known outside of Adam. And that is radical, whether we really understand it or not. And I think the more we begin to realize how radical this message is, the more we'll begin to really embrace all that God has for us in the kingdom of God. And so, you know, I know sometimes we say things, and even when I say it, I think, whoa, that's, you know, I'm, is that real? I mean, is that, for, is that really true? Or, or do you just think that's true or what? But I'm saying, this ought to, it ought to challenge us to rethink a lot of things. 
Because if we're not, we're just status quo. We're just going along with the flow, and nothing's really going to change any more than it has for the last 2,000 years. The way it's going to change is when people really get a revelation of this Jesus in us and us in Christ and what that really means, amen, to all of us as well as to the world around us. Amen. So with that said, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Drop down to verse 31 through 33 now. So God didn't send Jesus here to condemn everybody. He didn't send him here to condemn anybody. God came in the flesh to reveal his love for humanity. To let us understand that this is about, I want to save you. I don't want to condemn you. Now this goes for everybody, church, not just the people that are believers, because if it were not true, everybody else would be dead already and be in hell. We're in the dispensation of grace, and He's doing everything He can to bring these people to Him, back to the family of God, to have them born again so that they can, you know, populate the kingdom of God and increase the family of God. So he says, he that, over, he that cometh from above. Now remember, I said, we're born, from, we're born again. If we're born again, we're born from above. So this isn't just talking about Jesus. We are in Christ, and Christ is in us. So we have to identify with these scriptures as being about us as well as being about the Lord. We are heirs and joint heirs with Christ. He is the elder brother. We are all family in this same relationship. So these things all pertain to us as well as, as to Jesus. I know that sometimes has to stretch us because we know... Hey, we're not sinless like Jesus in terms of our flesh. But in the mind of God and by the Spirit, which is who we are, born again, we are spotless, we are without blemish, and we are pure and righteous and holy, just as holy as Jesus. Praise, God. Praise the Lord. So he that cometh from above is above all. He that's of the earth is earthly. Now he's making a distinction between the Spirit and the flesh. And speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth, and no man receiveth his testimony. He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. So if we're, as believers, we pretty much have sealed the fact that whatever God says is the truth. Right. Praise the Lord. All right, now let's go to uh, Galatians chapter 5 and we'll read verses 1 through 4. Galatians 5, 1 through 4. And Galatians 5 is an, it's an awesome chapter in the Bible. Uh, it, it, that and, and Romans 8 are probably two of the yeah. most yeah. powerful script, you know, portions of Scripture that a New Testament believer can grasp or try to understand and get involved in. So he says, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Now obviously we're not talking about the physical act of circumcision as such because you know I mean I won't go into all of that but that we're talking about a Jewish ritual that puts you into the the, the, the religious faith of, of Judaism and I, I shouldn't call it faith because there was no faith involved in it but into that religious uh, group amen and so he says if you if you're justified by the law or if you think that circumcision somehow makes you a Jew, Don said it best, we, we've been grafted in. And we are Jews, but in a sense, there is no Jew or Gentile because we all are part of the family of God. Abraham was the first Jew because he crossed over, and that's what Hebrew meant. And from that we get the Jewish uh, reality. But Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. And what Paul called falling from grace doesn't mean somebody sinned after they were saved. That's the impression we were all given, most of us anyway, as we were going through our church services and so on and so forth. But that's not what Paul's saying. It means they're trying to be justified by the law. This, the law has already been fulfilled. Paul's preaching this. We're now in the new covenant. And he's saying if you're trying to get justified by the law, you're not in grace. You're not operating in grace. So he's not talking about people that got born again and then do something wrong. He's talking about people that are trying to be justified by doing the rules, by keeping all the law. Amen. 
So let's look, look at this again, verses 3 and 4 again, Sheila, if you can. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, he is a debtor to do the whole law. So if you're using the law, any portion of it, you've got to keep it all. You can't just pick out something and say, well, I'm going to go along with that. But Because any time you do that, you, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you're fallen from grace. It's either Jesus or it's every bit of the law. Yeah. Now, he's not saying, okay, I'm born again. I was, I was saved and a week later I cussed somebody out or I, you know, I, I lied about something or I, I got drunk or I did this or I did that. You can just pick something, okay? That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about trying to justify yourself by keeping the rules. By keeping the commandments. Amen? Now, I'm not, before I go any further, I'm not saying that we should all just be blatant maniacs out here and doing whatever we want. But what I am saying is, the way that these lifestyles change are not from the outside in. You cannot fix somebody up from the outside. There's plenty of religions that do that. Dress you a certain way, make you do certain things, get rid of this, keep this, and all that. It doesn't work. No. It's trying to be justified by the law, by keeping rules. And that's what he's trying to get across to us. Now, it's been said, and I know it's, it's, it's almost cliche now, but, and I try to avoid cliches like the plague with every fiber of my being. But I'm just saying. It is the fact that we've said, you know, that, that it, it's from the inside out. If, if you believe in grace, eventually... I don't know how long it takes. Some people might take six months. Some people might take six years. Some people might take 60 years. But the, the change will come from that ex being accepted in the beloved, from understanding you are the righteousness of God. And there isn't a timeline. There isn't a, you know, you got six months to get this thing together here. No, you're saved. That's it. So you just, that's how we flow. So we're, we're, we're operating not from fixing things from the outside, but from being changed from the inside out. However long that takes. Yes. Praise the Lord. So, somebody who sins after salvation doesn't fall from grace. They fall into grace. Yeah. Anybody here, you don't have to raise your hand. Sin since you've been saved. You don't have to raise your hand because I already know you are. You have. Yes. And you will. Praise the Lord. You haven't fallen from grace. You fall into grace. Yes. Because we've been born again, yes. not by the works of the flesh, but by the grace of God, so that when we fail, what we call sin, we're not cast off, we're not critiqued, we're not, you know, defiled. We fall into the grace of God. In other words, when I do it, God says, by my stripes you're healed. By my grace you've been saved. Yes. Right? Yes. I paid the price for whatever it is. Amen. It's hard to accept sometimes. And I mean, I know we, we uh, intellectually, uh, you know, we acknowledge this. But when you are in a mess, you get in a big blow up with somebody or something happens and you feel really bad because you acted like a jerk or, you, you know, whatever. You know, you just feel sick almost because... It's condemnation. It's, it's the enemy and it's self-condemnation. That's a lie of the devil. Right. Now you may have to work that situation out with that other person or whatever the circumstance is. But as far as God's concerned, nothing's changed with you and Him. Right. You're accepted. You're still loved. And, it, and what, what I'm trying to get across is until we really grasp this, we really can't move into the power and the authority that we have in Christ. Because we're always under the thumb of the enemy. Right. And our own wrong thinking. Praise the Lord. So, where sin abounds, grace does that much more abound. I'm sorry, I didn't make this up. This is God's way. This is what God wants it to be. This isn't me wanting it because it's a good thing. It really is a good thing. But it's secondary that it's a good thing. It's just what God's plan is, and that's the way it is. Like it or not, or, or just love it and can't hardly believe it because it's so good, doesn't matter. It's still, that's just what it is. Yeah. Amen? All right, let's drop down here in Galatians 5 to verses 16 through 21. All of us are guilty of this. I, I don't think, I don't know that I've ever met anybody that, see, it, you know, we can look at somebody's 
behavior and we go, oh my God, you know, that can't be, God can't accept that, surely not. But Jesus shows us clearly in the, uh, you know, in the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm not going to go through all of it because you, uh, we've talked about it many, many times, but you know, it's not even what you do, it's what you think. Now you can't tell me that you haven't thought some bad thoughts, some negative thoughts, some counter productive thoughts in terms of the Bible. Everybody does. You're gonna, you're gonna, somebody's gonna make you mad. You're gonna be, you're gonna hate them for a little bit at least until you, if you repent or whatever. Or something else, you're gonna do something, or you're gonna think something, or you're gonna feel something. These are all coming short of the glory of God, which is sin. So everybody does this. And we don't get to pick which ones we think God's going to you know, be upset with and which ones He aren't. He isn't. Or He aren't either, praise the Lord. But anyway, I'm going to move on before I ruin the English language completely. This I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth after the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These are, they, these are contrary to the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in the past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Amen? So what does it mean to be in the flesh? Usually when we think of being in the flesh, we think it's doing something bad, doing a bad thing, right? But we never think of being in the flesh as being in religious flesh. Now, say, okay, well, what are you talking about? Read Galatians 5 and you'll find out this is what the Galatians 5 is all about, spirit and flesh. We've always thought, well, I, either I'm just super spiritual, praise the Lord, or I'm in the flesh. But in the context of what Paul's teaching here, he's talking about spiritual flesh. Amen? I'll show you what I mean. Now, let me, I'll come back to this, but let's go to Galatians now. Galatians 3, verses 1 through 3. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus, hath, Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you, receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? So the contrast here is living by law, or living by the Spirit. You can all see that, right? It's clear. If you're living by works of the law, you're in the flesh. Yes. Praise the Lord. All right. Now we'll go back to Galatians 5, 22 through 26. This is what's insane because the, the more religious you are, the more carnal you are. Yeah. If, if you understand what Paul's trying to get across here, the more religious you are, the more you are in the flesh. Not spiritual flesh, but it's still the flesh. So the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Praise the Lord. Galatians 6, 1 through 10. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Now, we used to think that meant, go get him and rebuke him. I, listen, when I left the, the organization I was in, I was working for uh, Eagle Ironworks. And uh, I resigned and dropped my license with that organization. And I wasn't preaching anymore. I was... Uh, I was an iron worker, praise the Lord. And this guy from the church that I had preached in many times, 
not the church that I pastored, but a church, one, just one of the local churches here in Des Moines that I had preached. He came and was waiting for me when I got off work. So I was coming up the street. There's buildings on either side where all the different functions of the foundry and things were. And I was coming to the gate to go over to the parking lot where my vehicle was. And he's standing there. And he says, uh, Brother Nathan. I said, yeah. He said, I have a word for you from the Lord. I said, well, good. He said, if you don't come back to the church, God's going to kill you. I swear to God, that's what he told me. And I said, well, thanks for the heads up and uh, talk to you later. Well, about, I don't know, six months later or something, I was riding my motorcycle out of Harley. I was coming from, in fact, I was coming from work and I was coming up 2nd Avenue. At that time, they were doing a bunch of road work in Ankeny. We, we lived in Ankeny at the time. And just as you come up to, uh, I think it's Ordnance Road, uh, or Labor, okay, and uh, which shows you why I was in the wreck. I didn't even know where I was. But anyway, I'm coming up 2nd Avenue. And to make that turn there, there was no shoulder. And there was just a big drop off because they had just poured a bunch of concrete there, but they hadn't put the shoulders in or anything. So I took that corner a little faster than I should have, and I didn't lean as far as I should have, and I hit the edge of that curb and dropped off and then hit the other side of it, and I was probably doing 50, and it flipped the motorcycle end over end. And I practically tore this ear off, and I had a concussion and some uh, fractured ribs and a dislocated or separated shoulder. And I was out cold, and the cops come, picked me up, and hauled me to the hospital. And I told Sally, when I came to, she and my daughter were there, and, the police were there wanting to take a urine test. I'm, st I mean, I'm all wrapped up. I'm laying there. I said, yeah, well, if you can get this thing working, well, that's, up to you. Yeah, that's fine. I'm going to take it. You know, I don't care. But, the, but I thought, and I told Sally the next day, I said, you know what? I'll bet they're, they're having a shouting fit down there at that church thinking that well, he ain't going to make it because this is the Lord. This is, this is the, you know, that's the kind of mindset that I'm talking about, that this isn't how God works. He, he, he doesn't punish us. Even if, even if that were, even what, if what I had done had been some re, kind of a rejection of God, which it wasn't, it was just a rejection of some of the doctrines that I couldn't, I just wasn't comfortable preaching and, and saying that this is, these are heaven and hell things, and and because they weren't, right. some of them might have been okay, and you know, you, if you feel like that's what you want to do, good, go with it. But I'm not going to tell people, hey, unless you do this and do that, you're going to hell. I mean, that, that makes me a bigger liar and, and phony than. Because I, I didn't believe it myself. How am I going to preach it to somebody else, you know? But I'm just saying, we never think of this being in the flesh as being in religious flesh. Amen? And so he says, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you that are spiritual, restore such a one. That doesn't mean to go and trying to threaten them with some kind of fear thing that God's going to kill you or something horrible is going to, you're going to get cancer or something bad's going to happen. Because that's not what he's talking about. He's saying if somebody's, if, if you see somebody overtaken in a fault and they're struggling, go and let them restore them. Let them know God loves you. Everything's cool. You know, this is all right. It's not the end of the world. God hasn't given up on you just because you've stumbled or because you've had an issue or because you did something that doesn't fit our, you know, spiritual uh, criteria. Amen. Our religious criteria, I should say. So, do this in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself unless you also be tempted. Because we all, could, we all do this. Right. Maybe not that thing, but some other thing that's just as, sure. just as negative, you know. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he's nothing, hey, I'm only whatever I am in Christ. I am because of Christ. It has nothing to do with me. It hasn't got any, I don't get any credit for this. The moment I try to take credit for it, I lose all of it. Yeah. Amen. So it's nothing. He's nothing. He deceives himself if you think that that's the problem with this idea of, of works. Is the more you do, the more you think you deserve some credit. Yeah. And somebody else that isn't doing exactly what you're doing, they deserve to be reprimanded or rebuked somehow. And that's the opposite of what he's trying to teach here. Let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. In other words, I don't need somebody else's approval. If I understand who I am in Christ, I can be happy. I can have the joy of the Lord. I can rejoice knowing that your, that opinion of somebody else's that makes absolutely no difference. They're entitled to their opinion, but it doesn't change the, the reality of my relationship with God. Amen? Amen. Every man shall bear his own burden. Let him be taught, who is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all things. 
Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever man sows, that shall he also reap. We're not talking about, you know, if you go out and, you know, get drunk, then you've got a bad thing coming. Something evil is going to happen to you because of, the, because of that. Now, something bad might happen because you get drunk and get in a fight or do something stupid and get yourself locked up. But that has nothing to do with God. That's just circumstances, okay? But he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He's talking about the flesh, the spiritual flesh that we're dealing with here. If you think that you're, you're, you're doing this stuff and, and by doing that you're going to reap some great benefit, no, you're going to reap corruption. Why? Because the law brings death. Right. Amen. Amen? Yes. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Yes. Let us not be weary then in well-doing. He's not talking about helping old ladies across the street or giving to charities. All of those things are fine, but that's not, the, that's not what he's talking about here. He's saying, he that well-doing for due season you will reap if we faint not. When we declare the Word of God, this is, you know, again, what Don was talking about, patience. In patience, possess ye your soul, your intellect, your, your mind, your way of thinking. And so when you sow, and you're sowing uh, money, or you're sowing, you know, actions and behaviors, or trying to help people and do things, you don't always get to see an immediate response. You don't always get immediate manifestation for what you've sown. But God will never forget a seed sown. Never. Never. So it's somewhere it's coming around. You know, what goes around will come around and it'll be God blessing you. But sometimes it doesn't happen like we think it ought to happen. As quickly as we think it ought to happen. In fact, most of the time it comes, it almost blindsides us. And then we go, oh, well, you know, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. But in the meantime, we've been kind of grumbling and thinking, well, you know, I did this and I did that. So don't be weary in well-doing because in due season you're going to reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them that are of the household of faith. Praise the Lord. That would be reaping the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, amen, all these things, okay? So now he goes on and says, if, if we look at this, we can understand where Paul was coming from because he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. All about works, all about outward appearance, amen? And so the Pharisees were, they were the perfect picture of religious flesh. They, they had their broad phylacteries, you know, and the things, little scriptures on their forehead, all the stuff going on, the long prayers for pretense, really, just to get people to look at him and say, boy, he must be spiritual. Did you hear that prayer? A parade of the flesh is what we're talking about. Uh -huh. And a lot of what goes on in religion today and in churches around the world is this holier-than-thou judgment. And that's still flesh. It is. It's religious flesh. I may have been saying spiritual flesh. If I did, I didn't necessarily mean it that way. Not, I meant it in the context of religious spirit, religious flesh. Amen. Philippians chapter 3, uh, verses 2 through 9. Praise the Lord. Don't underestimate me. Unless you're trying to guess my age. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I, it's the circumcision of the heart is what he's talking about, the spirit. And so I have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ, and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Praise the Lord. Look, we... <laughs> We live in a completely different world than the Jews did before Jesus came. Yes. It's a whole, it's not just, a, not only is it a different covenant, it's a completely different universe. 
And I don't mean because of technology or just time passing. I just mean because of the very fact that God brings this new covenant. It has changed everything. But we have been guilty of dragging this old covenant along with us just like they did. Maybe not to the same degree, but to some degree. And any degree makes us fall from grace in the sense that we're not operating by faith in grace. We're operating by faith in what I do yeah. relative to what the Word of God is demanding under the old covenant. Yes. Amen. So, and he be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. All right. Galatians chapter 6, uh, verse 12 through 15. Now, stay with me because I, I want to I get to a place where I can show you just how radical this change is. Because we have a tendency, even though we know these things to be true, somehow in our mind, I, I've, I've talked about this before about intellectual repentance, but we really need to just flush everything out. You know, when I, when I gave up that church and, and resigned the, the, the church there in Ankeny and, and dropped my license and all that stuff, I was praying in that what had used to be the old VFW in Ankeny. And we had it remodeled. We remodeled it and, and, did, and fixed it up and it was nice. Uh, and I was in there praying one day because I was fed up with all this. I mean, we had people getting up and when I, whenever I would try to move towards grace and I was trying to do it gradual because I thought, you know, if I get too crazy here, they'll all freak out. Well, they were freaking out with me just being subtle. Yeah. I mean, people in the door <laughs> in the church was on this side right here by the pulpit. The only way, the other way you went out the back door, but it went to the alley. And there, you know, the, where we, the seating area and everything was up here. So that went out. That door was right there. And I, honest to God, it happened several times. And I'm preaching along thinking, geez, they got to be, this ought to just be making them feel great. You know, there's some, relieving some of the tension and some of the pressure. And God loves you. And, and I mean, people get up and look at me and just storm right out, slam the door behind them. I mean, I, praise the Lord. You got to have a sense of humor. Amen. <laughs> But I, I, you know, hey, I, so, okay, but I'm just saying. It was crazy. And it happened often. You, you know, you try to figure this out. You think, who would not want the love of God? Who would not want to be blessed? Don't you care? <laughs> One brother, I won't tell you who he was. He's since deceased, but at the time, not because of God, but just <laughs> natural things. But... He said, don't you care about us, Brother Hamlin? He said, of course I do. I'm, I'm pastor in the church. I'm trying to, to do what I feel like God's leading me to do. And he said, well, then why don't you ever talk to us about hell? I said, what for? We're not going there. I mean, do I really need to know street laws in Bangladesh? I'm not going. I have no intention of going. I don't ever want to go. I don't need to know which side of the street you can park on, you know, where you, you know, I, but that's the mindset. They were used to being dangled over hell, service after service after service, fear constantly being fed to them, and, you know, praise the Lord. But as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that you may glory in your flesh. I remember a young girl came. Not, I mean, she was in her late 20s probably. And you could smell the cigarette smoke all over. It didn't bother me. I smoked for years. You know, I mean, you know, it smells worse when you don't smoke. But I could, you know, so what? And she wanted to play the guitar. <laughs> and I mean, there was an uproar. I mean, it, I thought it was, it was like a Frankenstein movie. They're going to come with torches, you know, and burn my house down and drag me out in the street. It was insane. Just a, a young girl that wanted to love God. And that's the only way she knew how to do it, to do something to worship the Lord. And I let her, and you would think I had released Satan from the pit, you know. I mean, it was like a nightmare. So I'm just saying, I think I'm helping this young girl to, to, you know, to kind of feel like she's part of what's going on and get past some of the issues that she had in her life, you know, and a way to connect. And I turn out to be this horrible person, you know. But that's what he's talking about. God forbid. 
So, and then he goes on, he says, For God forbid I should glory, saving the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but the new creature. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yep. It's the new creature we're talking about here. See, these Judaizers had crept into the church to see if these believers were being circumcised or not. If they were following the same old rules, amen? Which was a mixture of law and grace. They wanted Jesus, but they wanted Jesus with all the old rules and regulations, amen? And so it was like a, it was like a gold star, you know, or a notch on your gun belt, you know. Every time they compelled somebody to be circumcised, it was religious pride. I want them to be as paranoid as I am. Right? Praise the Lord. Today, it might be the, the, the religious pride of, of getting people to agree with the dress code or, you know, like I said before, the different rules and can't have this, get rid of your TV, you know, don't burn all your records. Well, they don't have records anymore, but whatever, you know, CDs and so forth. And agree with these people, you know, conform to this religious idea of what you consider to be holy. Now, one of the things that fascinated me from the very beginning was television was an absolute devil. Can't happen. And uh, what amazed me was everybody had a monitor, which is like a you know, computer screen. They called them monitors. And you'd drive by the video stores when we lived in East Texas, and it was all these holiness Pentecostals lined up to get their videos. Watching the same stuff that was on TV, the only thing that they weren't getting were the commercials, which was kind of bright, but on the other hand, they, the thing that they were cursing everybody else about, they were doing the same thing. That's what he's trying to say. They just kind of twisted it around to make it look like, oh, hey, we don't have, we, we burnt that TV, we took it and put it in the dumpster, you know, and, and I remember giving mine to the neighbor, figured, hey, he's going to hell anyway. He might as well have a TV, you know, on the way. And, you know, that's the way it was. It gave him all my old rock and roll records. And, I mean, I had a, I had a, a real collection. It would be worth a fortune today, but nevertheless, he got my classic vinyl. And, uh, but I figured, so what? He's going to hell. Doesn't matter. But that's what I'm saying. And I've told these stories before, but only because it's, it's, it's how crazy it gets. And it's not just in this one group. We all got these little weird kind of ways of thinking. And we function from that place. Amen. So, Galatians 2, verses 4 and 5. I told you there's a lot of scripture. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom he gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So these people come in, snuck in, or got in there, and then tried to manipulate things or preach stuff that compromised the real gospel to get them back under the law. And Paul said, we didn't, let, we didn't stand for it for a minute. The minute we saw it, we said, we're not going there. That's not what we do. Now, I know by experience, it can be difficult not to yield to the pressure of religious flesh. And that's one of the tools and weapons that are used to conform. You, you know, you, first of all, it's not, I don't want to call it uh, uh, a cult. But by definition, in some ways it is. Because it's to separate you from everything except this group then you feel obligated to keep the rules of that group and the reason for that is you want to fit in nobody else wants anything to do with you right so you got to fit in with these people and in order to fit in with them you got to follow the rules and the box elders are back praise the Lord if you don't believe me open that door and they'll come in like a horde of locusts Praise the Lord. But anyhow, that's what I'm talking about. So it's trying to get us to conform. And I know that that, that could be difficult. Because we like to be accepted. Even when you say, I don't care what other people think. And I say that all the time. There's a part of us that does care. We don't want to be the weird one. We don't want to be always, you know, outside of everything. So it's just natural. But it's religious flesh. But it's still flesh. And it stinks. Yeah. Yeah. Praise the Lord. 
He stinketh. You know, I mean, that's what they said about Lazarus. That was flesh. And that's what we're talking about here. It was religious flesh. It still stinks. Praise the Lord. Galatians 2, 11 through 16 now. But when Peter was come to Antioch, and I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter, Before them all, if thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why are you compelling the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. Now he's talking about Jews. Amen. When he talks about the sinners of Gentiles, it just means that prior to the coming of Christ, Gentiles had no access to God except through Judaism. Right. But that's all changed now. And so he says, not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ. Even us Jews have believed this. Amen. That we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Praise the Lord. So at least one aspect of this being in the flesh is trying to be justified by the works of the law instead of faith in Christ. Right. And anybody that knows anything about what I'm talking about here in particular groups, it's true of all, but I'm just, I, I'm familiar with the one, is that, look, they're compelling people to do things that they're not doing. They put on the show to say that this is what you've got to do when in fact they don't really believe all of it. They're not really doing all of it. It's, it gives them a sense of authority and power and control by making people do stuff, amen, to be a part of our group. Praise the Lord. Now, Romans chapter 7, verses 5 and 6. I'm trying to get to understand how radical, really, this, this message is that Jesus brought. We have kind of, I think we've kind of simplified it and dumbed it down to just another religion that's not as difficult as the other one. It's not that at all. It's something totally new, something totally different. And I don't think, for the most part, Christianity has really embraced it to the degree that God wants us to. And Because if we had, we'd be seeing manifestations that we haven't seen, that we know are ours by faith in the Word of God. Amen. Amen. So, for when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Praise the Lord. You've become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Yeah. Being in the flesh is being under the law. We were taught being in the flesh meant, I don't know, you were fornicating or you were drunken or you were something. But that isn't what he, that's not what it is. Being in the flesh is being in religious flesh. Being under the law. So he introduced this whole new way of living, Jesus did. Totally, absolutely changed. And that's what freaked everybody out because it was so unconnected to what they had believed for, for millennia. And what was really devastating was what they had been believing was misinterpreted. Which is why he came to show them the truth of what he really was all about. Amen. It was a whole new world that he was ushering in. Amen. Serving in newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. And we're going back to where I said I'd get back to it in a little bit here. But. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. 
Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in the time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now usually we preach against the top few, the big sins. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the bad ones, praise the Lord. <laughs> Adultery, fornication, whatever. Murder, maybe. And forget, in the same list, is envy, strife, yeah. hatred, wrath, seditions, heresies. Yeah. And that's what religious flesh produces. Envies, strife, murders, revelings. Yes. <laughs> if you don't believe me, I can take you to church and let you experience it for yourself firsthand. Praise the Lord. It's the law, Scripture says, it's the law that gives sin strength. Yes. Paul said, I didn't know covetousness until I heard I wasn't supposed to do it. Right. And then it wouldn't leave me alone. Then I coveted everything. The warning is that doing such things shall not inherit the kingdom. If you do these things, you won't inherit the kingdom of God. That doesn't mean you won't go to heaven. Say it again. Doing those things as a believer, if you fall into that, do that, doesn't mean you're not going to heaven. It means you're not going to enter the kingdom of God. The kingdom is here. Yes, it is. It's right here. It's here and now. Amen? Because inheritance is not earned. Either way. Positive or negative. The grace is grace. Amen? It's a gift. Eternal life isn't just something you get when you die. Praise the Lord. It's something you possess right now in Christ. Being in Christ right now, you already possess it. And He'll never leave you or forsake you. You won't maybe never enjoy the benefits of the kingdom in this natural world. You'll suffer with all of the other mess that people who are not saved suffer because they're not operating in the kingdom Amen. laws and rules and, and, and uh, edicts of God right. within the kingdom I'm talking about. And when I say rules and that, I'm, I'm not talking about punishment. I'm talking about how you possess the promises. Uh -huh. Praise the Lord. All right. So, John 17 verse 3. Remember, God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world, right? He said, this is life eternal, that they might know Thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom Thou hast sent. Knowing God, and that God in the flesh, which is Jesus, is eternal life. Yes. That guarantees heaven. But it doesn't guarantee you a function in the kingdom of God in this life. Right. That's why people from all different kinds of denominations and, and faiths and so forth can be saved, can go to heaven. But they don't get healed down here. That's right. They don't get delivered. They live in poverty. Right. They live in strife. They, leave in, they, they live in confusion and, and conflict all of yes. the time. Yes. they got to die to get any enjoyment out of this relationship. But that was not the intent of God. That wasn't the plan of God, nor is it the purpose of God to bring us through all sorts of pain and suffering. He's trying to get us blessed to bring heaven to earth. Amen. Amen. Pray this way, he said. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yes. No sickness, no disease, no poverty, no, no frust, you know, not, not the fighting and all the other things that go on. Okay, Romans 7, 21 through 8, 1. 7, 21 through 8, 1. Paul gets a revelation. He told us before, I'm the Pharisee of Pharisees. I'm the, if, somebody's, if somebody's living by the law and doing it right, I'm, I'm your role model. You want to see somebody that's done it, I'm the one. But look how his life was living that way. I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. This is legalistic ways of thinking. It's, it's, it's 
uh, religious flesh. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You know what I'm talking about here now, this, this, the, the, the religious spirit. The, the, we're not walking in the flesh, which is a religious flesh, but we're walking in the Spirit, amen, of God. And this revelation Paul discovered is in the last verses of Romans 7, and it delivers him from religion. Yes. That's how he's saying it. This is how I got delivered from that whole way of living my life. Who can deliver me from this continuous, constant struggle to do everything, dot every T, I, cross every T, and so on and so forth? Jesus, there's no condemnation. If I come to Him, I'll find there is no condemnation. Yes. There's no more guilt. There's no more shame. There's no more feeling bad all the time and negative and like a failure and, you know, I'm under the curse and all these things. It was a revelation of freedom from the law. Praise the Lord. That's what he's talking about. Paul declared both in Romans 8 and Galatians 5. Freedom from the law. Freedom of the thing that had me bound for years and years and years and all of his life for that matter. The moment you realize that you're redeemed from the law because of what Christ has done, because Christ is the end of the law for righteousness sake to all who believe. When you have that revelation, I'm not talking about just having the information. I'm talking about when you have that revelation, you can declare the first, first verse of Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation. Praise the Lord. When you understand that our righteousness is secure and it's a gift, it takes the weapon of condemnation away from you takes the weapon away from the enemy mm -hmm. and it takes it away from me. I don't condemn me. I don't condemn you. I don't need to. Exactly. Exactly. You say, well, what about the big thing? No big or little. Yeah, right. Just no condemnation. Yeah. If you're a believer, it doesn't matter how stupid you are, you're still a believer. Yes. I don't mean to be yes. cruel. I'm just saying people do foolish things, yes. but it doesn't make them unsaved. That's right. And there should still not be any condemnation in that person because they're not being judged by their actions. They're being judged by their faith in Christ. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. That's the revelation yes. of the good news yes. of Christ. Hallelujah. And we've made it all kinds of other stuff, but that's how simple it is. Amen. Praise the Lord. You understand that your righteousness is secure. No weapon formed against you can prosper. You'll live in no condemnation. You'll live a life of freedom. And you know what? When you get free, you set people free. You cannot free people when you're bound. Yes. Amen. All you can do is lock them up in the same chains you're in. Sure. Praise the Lord. The reason there can never be any condemnation is because there's no law. <laughs> we are not under the law. The more we behold our new face, the more we are transformed. Praise the Lord. Let me, let's, uh, under the Old Covenant, let me show you something here. I'm going to back up a minute. We're not under the law, so there's no condemnation. Under the Old Covenant, the Old Covenant was a covenant of fear. Everything was motivated by fear. Uh -huh. Read Deuteronomy if you don't believe me. You, you want to be blessed? This is what you got to do. If you don't do this, this is what's going to happen to you. Mm -hmm. It's fear. It's all fear motivated. Amen. The new covenant is motivated by faith. Praise the Lord. The just shall live by faith. Yes. You have to take people back to their new identity in Christ. You... It doesn't work condemning people. No. You, won't, you won't win them to the Lord. You'll, you may make them do some stuff, 
But it, it's not a transformation. It's just a lockstep. It's just people just doing what they're, con they're told to do out of fear. Yes. <laughs> the just will live by faith. So we need to get them back to their identity. Back to the perfect law of liberty. Galatians 5.13. Remember he said, you know, let's, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Then he goes on in, in, in Galatians 5 verse 13. And he says this about love. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Now we thought that meant, okay, I've got grace so I can do anything I want. Don't do that. Don't ever have a beer. Don't ever do this. Don't ever think. Don't ever. That's not what he's saying. Brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion for the flesh, but by love serve one another. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Don't condemn. Love. Yes. It's not our job to find the fault. Yes. Our job is to love them. Amen. Period. Amen. See, that rubs us the wrong way because religion has been all the, just the total opposite of this. Sure. See somebody doing something wrong, you better point it out. You better get them straightened out because they're going to go to hell. No, they're not. They may have some problems in this life, but your job is to love them. Yes. Don't have to love the act. You don't have to love the behavior. You've got to love them. Exactly. exactly. Because that's what Jesus does. Yes. James 1, 22 through 25. James 1, 22 through 25. I'm, I'm saying that's why this is radical. Because it takes, really it takes us and religion out of the picture. Because if we actually live by this, we are going to be radically different than any religion that you are going to find here. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like unto a man beholding his natural face in the glass. For if he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead and uh, put 26 up there, too. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. So, the perfect law of liberty will cause you to look in the mirror of the God's Word, into the Bible, and behold your natural face. Not, he's not talking about the face we see in the mirror. That Greek word for natural face here is the Genesis face. I talked about this, I don't know, a few weeks back. But it's, it's talking about the Genesis face or the new birth face. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. The man in the mirror is a new man. The face of our new birth. The face of the new creature. Yes. The born again reality. Yes. That's what we're supposed to see in this word. Yes. That's how we're supposed to see ourselves. Okay? So the more we behold our new face, this born again face, this Genesis face, the more we are transformed. Yes. Yes. So the more we embrace grace, the more we embrace this, the righteousness of God in Christ, the no condemnation, the more we get transformed. Yes. You don't get transformed by pointing out everybody's stuff. That's right. you, you bless them by bringing them back to their true identity. Yes. By telling them who they really are. By speaking to that new identity. By speaking to that Genesis face. Yes. You love them. You don't critique them. You love them. Let, let the Holy Spirit deal with them. Because until we... Look, we talked about this a little bit Wednesday night. You can't, you can't hate somebody into a relationship with Jesus. If you love them and make them feel accepted... Now the door has been opened sure. for you to witness to them about the love of God and what God really wants to do in their life. You make it a confrontation, you, you're, you're done with that. that. That person's finished with you. They're going to move on. They're going to trust you. Amen? You have to bring them back to their identity, back to, their, to affirming them in Christ. Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. The more we behold our new face, 
the more we're transformed. And it's from that transformation, that revelation, that we become a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Praise the Lord. Revelation 21 says, Behold, I make all things new. Yes. Praise yes. God. And He does it by the indwelling Spirit through the power of the resurrection, not by our effort. Yes. Walking in the Spirit is trusting God to do the work in you. And you don't get to pick the time line. Right. A lot of junk I wish I didn't have. I have thoughts I wish I didn't think. Yeah. God's business, not mine. I can't. I, if I could change it, I would have changed it by now. Sure. Right? Yeah. And all of us got some baggage, right? And we'd like to unload, but we just, it just doesn't go away. It may go away until 3 o'clock in the morning. I wake up at 2 o'clock this morning, I'm laying there thinking, God, what, the, what am I doing away here? Finally, it's 3 o'clock. Oh, this is ridiculous. I'll try a different spot. So I get up, I go upstairs. There's no bed up there, by the way. Just a big old chair with a Fortunately, a big ottoman. So I got two pillows and a blanket, and I'm watching reruns of the, all the ball games that were on yesterday that was depressing to begin with, because only one team that I cared about won, all the rest of them lost. And uh, anyhow, so I'm watching it for a little bit, and finally I just thought, I can't do this anymore. So I shut it off, and finally went to sleep. But why? I mean, I don't even know what was going on that was keeping me from going to sleep. But something was. You know, that's what I'm saying. That we've got stuff that we don't even know what it is. And until we really understand how blessed we are, how delivered we are. I, what was odd was we've got this little, you know, memory box. I've got a flip thing that I flip every morning. It's got a different scripture and some stuff on it. And then there's a little memory box. And on that memory box, when I pulled it out, it says, He gives His beloved sleep. And I thought, woo, that didn't work last night. Praise the Lord. <laughs> where, where were you, Father? You know, but I mean, I'm just saying. That's kind of where we get sometimes. So, walking in the Spirit is trusting God to do the work in you. Being in the flesh is trying to do it through human effort, through religion. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Loose them and let them go. Yes, yes, yes. Even if they stink, yes. let them out. Praise the Lord. Let them go. All right, let's, let me begin to wrap up here. Matthew chapter 3, 13 through 17. This is where we started out. I'm just backing up a little bit. But uh, Matthew 3, uh, verse 13 through 17. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. Remember, I said this is a, whole, this is a new world. We, we, you can't keep looking at this thing as some uh, patched up old covenant or improved old covenant. It's a totally different animal. Amen. So then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him saying, I have need to be baptized of thee. And comest thou to me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Suffer it to be so now. For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now remember I've said before, when you find revelation, you'll find affirmation and confirmation and, and witnesses of it over and over and over. And that's what I want to show you. John was a son of Zacharias, who was a priest. And in fact, there's, there, there's chronological gospels that talk about the reason Zacharias was killed at the, at the altar. You know how they used to do, if you could go to the altar and hang on to the altar, there's a lot of Old Testament scriptures about this, they couldn't kill you there. Remember David's one of David's right hand men, De you know, deceived him went and, and sided with his son who was Absalom, who was in rebellion against him. When David found out, the guy runs to the temple and grabs a hold of the horns of the altars because he, he's safe there, right? Well, that's, praise the Lord, Zacharias was killed because he wouldn't give away the location of John to the ministry, to the priests that were looking for him, okay? So, John was the son of Zechariah, who was a priest of Levi. That was the only people that could be priests, right? And John's mother, Elizabeth, if you check her genealogy, she was also from priestly descent. Amen. So both sides of the family of John the Baptist came from priestly genealogies. They were Levites. Otherwise they couldn't have been priestly. Amen. 
That would make John the Baptist, if you, if you go back and look at the criteria needed for a high priest, that would make John the Baptist the heir apparent to be high priest. Yes. Both sides of the family. He's pure. He's pure stock, right? All right. Look at Leviticus chapter 8 and verse 6. This blows my mind. So Leviticus 8, 6. This is Moses. And Moses brought Aaron and his sons, the original priests, and washed them with water. Okay? This was Aaron and his sons' inauguration into the priesthood. Amen. If you go on and read it, you'll see it, and then they go on and on with all the other stuff. But this was the, the inauguration. So what's happening in the Jordan River? You've got the heir apparent, high priest, John the Baptist, and he's fulfilling all righteousness, the Scripture says. How? By washing Jesus in the river to prepare him for the priesthood. Yes. Praise the Lord. What John was doing was relinquishing his priesthood. He said, i got to decrease, and he's going to increase. He was preparing him for the priesthood. So John was relinquish, relinquishing his priesthood after the order of Levi to a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Yeah. Whole different animal. Praise the Lord. A change of priesthood is what's going on here. Now we see a lot of things going on, but that's, that's the base reality. Okay? Hebrews chapter 7, verses 12 through 17. Hebrews 7... Uh, 12 through 17. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. In other words, you change the priest, the law is going to change. The priesthood changes and the law is changing. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. In other words, Jesus didn't come from a Levite family. He came from the tribe of Judah. So, for it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning the priesthood. He didn't say anything about, well, there may be some priests come out of Judah. No, they're, they're either Levites, and to this day, they're Cohens. If you're, you can't trace your genealogy back, you can't be in the priesthood, which is one of the issues they have today with having a temple and all the rest of it, but that's another story. It is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. Melchizedek had no beginning, no end. So for the test, he testifies, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And there's a change of priesthood. There's also a change of the law. Yeah. We are no longer under the law. We are under grace. It's a whole new world. Yes. It's a whole different world. And we're trying to mesh them somehow. And it doesn't work. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 5, 5 through 14. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest. He didn't make himself a high priest. He didn't glorify himself to become a high priest. But he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. That's who made him the high priest. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that, that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared... Praise the Lord. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Called of God, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. He had a problem getting this across to people back then. Again, what Don was saying, I'm not belaboring this other than, hey, the Jews still got a problem today. They're dull of hearing when it comes to anything spiritual. Because right. they operate strictly by rules, by laws. Okay, so uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. For when, for the time you ought to be teachers. Now he's talking to everybody. When you ought to be teaching this. 
you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, or the foundation of what it is we're supposed to be teaching. Ye have need that one teach you again of the oracles of God that are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Yeah. Praise the Lord. I just thought, I thought, sorry, I just thought of something and now it's gone, but... You can't receive it religiously. This is radical. It's all God. It's all grace. You can't you can't just pick some stuff that's good out of the old one and make it fit in this. It, it doesn't work that way. We have to get as radical as he was. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, the very fact that we are not totally shunned by every other religion, or I'm talking about not, not religion, but every other denomination, that the fact that we're not totally uh, trying to be run out of town is because we're not radical enough. True. We still kind of like them. True. Christ didn't glorify himself to be a priest. But he was made a high priest. Matthew 3, 16 and 17. Now remember what I was saying at the very beginning. These scriptures don't just pertain to Christ. If we are in Christ, they pertain to us. Mm -hmm. Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom... I am well pleased. I remember telling, I think I've probably told you about this before, but years ago, I was up here at the altar praying one time. It was just, you know, it was during the day, and I was by myself. And I was praying, and I heard the Lord in my spirit, clearly as I've ever heard the Lord speak to me, say, you're my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And I was looking around like, must be somebody else in here. You can't be talking to me. But you see what I'm saying? I, I'm accept I accept you. He was trying to get me to some place that I didn't know how to get there. He was trying to affirm me and make me understand grace in a way that I hadn't comprehended it. I knew it was there. I knew it was out there. I just didn't know how to relate to it. Amen? Voice from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Now, this is when Jesus is being made a high priest. He didn't make himself a high priest. God made him one and he affirmed it by saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He's just been washed. He's been inaugurated into the Melchizedek priesthood. We have been made kings and priests after the order of Melchizedek, not after the order of an old covenant. Our job is not to go around finding fault with everybody and then demanding a sacrifice. Praise the Lord. Our job is to love them, affirm them. Amen. Amen. Bless them. Show them their true identity in Christ. When Jesus comes out of the water, the heavens open, and the Spirit of God, it says like a dove, descended on him. And then comes this proclamation. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Spirit, the Spirit looked like a dove, but it was the Spirit of God. And the voice comes uh, in in, uh, a, in continuation of the, uh, 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 of the Spirit, saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. It's an affirmation of God. It's God affirming, and it's His inauguration as high priest of a better covenant with better promises, with a better tabernacle, and better sacrifice. And heaven opened, and it hasn't closed since, and it never will. The dove that flew out of Noah's ark, think about it. What was it doing? It was looking for an olive branch. It was looking for peace. That's what the olive branch, you know, symbolizes. He was looking for an olive branch, and what? A new world. Praise 
God. And we just found one. In fact, we just found both in the Jordan River. When the dove landed on Jesus, it said to John, right here is this new world. Right here is the olive branch. Right here is the peace between God and humanity. It's a whole new world. We have peace with God. That's a different world. That's a whole new world. And people are waiting on a kingdom that's been here for 2,000 years. Waiting on a new world. And it's already here. Mike said it earlier. Mystery of Christ in you. He is the new world. And we are in Christ, the hope of glory. The kingdom is entered by the new birth. And it's ministered by the Holy Spirit. And it's in a covenant with an open heaven. With direct access to God. You don't have to go to a priest. You are a priest. After the order of Melchizedek. Joshua 18 verses 1 through 3. And I really am about done. Just one more scripture after this. Joshua 18 1 through 3. The whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle of the congregation there, and the land was subdued before them. The land was subdued before them. There remained among the children of Israel seven tribes which had not yet received their inheritance. And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, How long are ye slack to go to possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers has given you? Jesus has completely subdued our enemies. He's made him his footstool. And He's handed us the promised land called rest. Called grace. But there are still people who haven't stepped into their inheritance. In fact, according to this, the majority, seven tribes out of twelve, hadn't gotten their inheritance. Living like strangers, right? In the land of promise. Mm -hmm. If that isn't the church, I don't know, I don't know how else you could define it. With all of this, and we're not seeing the promises. We're not seeing the blessings. We're not seeing the manifestations of everything God's promised us. Living like strangers in the promised land. Our inheritance is in Christ. In Christ, all of God's promises are yes and amen. It's a new world. Peace between us and God. Last scripture, the one we started with, John chapter 3, verse 17. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but through Him, but that the world through Him might be saved. It's a new world, and we are new creations. We need to wake up to the radicalness of this truth and really start living it. I told Eric yesterday we were the last ones to leave, just kind of hanging out and talking. I said, I, I told him I just read something. I, said, I told Sally the other day the same thing. Uh, Einstein was not a you know believer the way we would think of as a believer, but he was a believer. I mean, he was a believer in the supreme being. And I think it was because of his intellect and the fact that he's seen so much time, space, continuums, all these different things that the natural mind and, and religion couldn't define. So he knew there had to be something going on out here way beyond anything we could comprehend in the natural. And he had, he had a different things. He said, one thing he said was, you know, life is like uh, riding a bicycle. To stay balanced, you have to keep moving. And that just speaks to me of Revelation. Without revelation, you become stagnant. You become stuck in something that is less than what God really wants for us. And that's what happens with religion. That's why we have different revelations. But the problem is, instead of it moving everybody forward, it moves one little group forward. And everybody else locks in on the thing that they already have. Mm -hmm. And then tells everybody else that believes on something beyond that, that uh, they're heretics or something. 
I think God's continuously giving us revelation because that's how life is supposed to be. That's how you stay balanced in this thing with God, is by continually being moved forward. And it looks radical to people who are stuck or satisfied with the status quo. And if it doesn't look radical, it probably means we're not radical enough. We're not moving to the degree that we should. The other thing that I wanted to mention that Einstein said was there are two ways to live. You can live your life as if nothing is a miracle, or you can live your life as if everything is a miracle. That's the choice I made a long time ago, and Sally will tell you the truth. I, I, everything's a miracle to me. I'm looking for something in everything that God does. Whether it's negative, whether it's positive, whether it's whatever it is, I'm, I'm seeing it as God's trying to do something miraculous. Yes. And I'm telling you, a lot of the things that happen in this church, mm-hmm. I see it as God saying, can I trust you with this? Yeah. Can I really trust you? Because what we call revival, I, I'm sorry, I just don't think it's revival. I think it's something else. It may be some reformation going on and other things, but what God really wants to do is something so radical right. that it could really be defined as that's revival, new life. And I, you know, this is just me, but I think one of the reasons why the church is the size that it is and not, you know, blown up and become thousands of people or what have you. One of them, first of all, that's not really my motive. I want to reach people, but that isn't my uppermost goal is to see how many people we can get in this building. My greatest goal is to, to understand God in a way that I didn't understand Him yesterday. Right. and to be able to share that with somebody else Amen. and help people to really see what this God is. That's our job. That's, we're supposed to be a revelation of God. Go. We cannot be a revelation of God unless we're willing to be radical. And if you're going to be radical, you're going to get rejected. Yep. Praise the Lord. Mm-hmm. We've had crazy stuff happen here. I remember when, when we first moved to this building shortly after, there were a lot of people, uh, more people than there are here now, that came and a lot of them were from the denomination that we had come out of. Some of you all know because you were you know, part of that too. And, uh, and I remember saying it because I was constantly getting feedback about so-and-so cut her hair. And? Who's the beautician? Let's all go there. No, I mean, it was, it was like jealousy and you know, frustration and so forth. And I had one individual come to me and say, well, first of all, she disrespected her husband beyond belief in front of everybody in the church that particular day. I mean, just, you know, I mean, come on, husbands and wives, I get it. I mean, we, we, we kind of talk down to each other. You know, you kind of mock each other and kid around back and forth and stuff, but it's not, it's not hateful. And I wouldn't do it in front of other people. I'd never, even if I was just kidding with her, I wouldn't do it in a way that would demean her. I might privately. <laughs> I'm just saying, but I wouldn't, you know, but I would never do it in front of other people. I would never humiliate her, nor would I stand for being humiliated, you know, just out of sheer joy of humiliating somebody. That's what this person did. And I mean, she made him look like an idiot. And I I was embarrassed and I don't get embarrassed easy, but I was embarrassed for him. And, you know, he didn't know what to do. So, and let me tell you, she had hair. But literally, when she didn't have it up, it would touch, it would drag the floor. Mm-hmm. Well, it just wasn't, just shortly after that, and I never said anything about it at the time. I thought, that's his wife, Let, you know, that's between them. I'm not going to get involved in this. Maybe that's the way they do it. So, a couple of few days later, one of the other women that had come from that same background had cut her hair. And she was all kind of happy, you know, and she joined. I said, your hair really looks nice, you know, and I thought it did. I mean, it looked... It looked different. It looked nice. I'm not a beautician, but it looked okay. It looked good. And this gal flipped out. She's got this really long hair. She come into my office and she said, Brother Ham, aren't you going to say something about these people cutting their hair? And I said, well, why? Why would I say anything to her? This woman's 40 years old or older. You know, I'm, like, I'm going to tell her how to cut her hair. And she said, well, a woman's hair is her covering and angels are looking into this. And I said, well, let me ask you something. If angels have eyes, if angels can see, they must be able to hear. And if they can hear, you've just screwed yourself as far as being a witness because of your hair. Because you've already shown everybody you don't respect your husband, 
Therefore, you must not respect God. If you want to follow this train of thinking, this way of looking at life, then you're stuck. You might as well shave your head, is what the scripture says. Now, I'm not condoning any of that. I don't care how long your hair is, how short your hair is. I, it doesn't mean anything to me. But when I said it, this is not going to be that group, LITE, L-I-T-E. We're not going to be that organization, just not as strict. That's not who we're going to be. That's not what we're trying. We're trying to do what I felt God had told me and what I feel like God has told all of you. That's why you're here is that He wants to show us a new thing. He wants us to look at this Bible like we never looked at it, through other denominational eyes, that we'll look at it purely from a, I want to know what you want, Lord. I want to understand you, and I want to understand how I interact with you. Yes. So that I can function in this new world the way I'm supposed to, so that I can have everything you've promised me. Yes. And it wasn't a matter of a few weeks later. In fact, we were putting in these new lights, because we used to have these those big old kind of gothic looking chandeliers and we, we wanted to get them out and so we took them out and we were putting in all these new lights and a couple of the guys that were working with me in fact John's not here now but he was there one of the days that we were doing it and this stuff came up and I said well guys look here's the way it is this is a whole new game we're, we're not going back we're not trying to recapture any of that we're, we're moving on to wherever God wants to take us within a week or two weeks the congregation was cut in half because every one of those people left. And they went searching for other yeah, light churches. Well-watered plains, praise the Lord. So I'm just saying, I'm not intimidated by numbers, large or small. What I want is to know what God really wants to do in our lives. And so I'm not afraid. I'm not saying, look, I'm not God. I'm just His son, you know? But I'm not afraid to take a chance with the Word of God. I've got more confidence in God than I have in my intellect. I can make mistakes. I can be wrong. and I've, I've proven that over the course of my life. What I believe today isn't what I believed 10 years ago. And what I believe 10 years from now may not be exactly what I believe today. I hope not. I hope I know more there than I know now. But if I'm not willing to move forward into what He shows us now, even if I'm not positive... I can't expect to be crying out for more revelation if I won't walk in the revelation that He's given me. If I won't take a chance on the revelation that I think He's given me, I can't expect that there'll be any more. I'd rather risk being wrong in the pursuit of God than to be right and stagnant in the old stuff that we've all known all of our lives. And I think God endorses that. I think God embraces that because that's what I see all throughout the New Testament is people coming and going, Aha! That's what God's trying to get us. That's what God's trying to show us. Yes. And that's what Jesus was doing. He's saying, this is a whole new ball game, folks. Yep. Yes. Everything's changing. Priesthood has changed. Laws are changed. Every covenant has changed. We're moving into a new world. Yes. And unless you're willing to move into that world, you have no part of it. You can't, you can't participate in it. You've got to wait to die to get the benefits of what that new world was all about. Yes. Yes. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So let's get radical. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes. And cost anything to be radical except maybe a friend or two. You can always get another one. Hallelujah. <laughs> Give the Lord a hand this morning. Praise God. Amen, amen. God bless you. I just challenge you to just let God stretch you. Let Him give you some stuff that cause you to scratch your head and say, Is that you, the Lord? Or, you know, just really do it. That's what He wants to do. He wants to be a revelation. Yep. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless all of you. Appreciate your patience. Have a great week. Be radical. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.
you bring this? Yeah, I give it to you. Thank you, Mike. 